So guys, you all know that my favorite body part is of course the knee joint and one of my favorite injuries in the knee joint are meniscal injuries. So let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. First of all, let's dive into our anatomy model so we can check out what these menisci are all about. So here with our clinical physioanatomy model, we have a top-down view of the tibia or the shin bone, which of course is one of the major components of the knee. And we have two menisci, single word meniscus. We have the medial meniscus, which is on the medial or inside of our knee. And we have the lateral meniscus, which is on the lateral or outside of our knee. Now, as you can see, these are two kind of half moon shape crescent structures, and they have some really important roles at the knee. The first role they have is to help with spreading out force at the knee. We can see how they're not perfectly flat. That's a good thing. It means that it allows for a little bit of cushioning to transmit forces backwards and forwards, side to side within the knee, so there isn't this complete compression whenever the knee is moving. Now, if we look at it, the meniscus from a different point of view, we can see how they're thicker towards the outsides. So here's the outer side of the knee, we can, of the meniscus, we can see it's definitely thicker than the inside. And you can see the same here, on the medial side too, you can see how the rise on the outside is going to be much greater. What that allows for is for the condyles of the femur to actually sit inside those meniscus, which means it takes up a little bit of a better position within the joint and it increases stability because it reduces the chances of the femur moving too far off compared to if the tibia was just a nice flat surface where the meniscus was just too flat and that would mean excess movement is possible. So really important structures. Now let's talk about how they get injured. So the most common way in which the menisci get injured is with twisting injuries. Now if I use my knee model I'm going to bring it in quite close here and hopefully you can see if I really twist the model, you can see how the blue structure of the meniscus kind of twists with it. And what it means is that the femur or the thigh component almost grinds into that meniscus, which means that if there's a really heavy twist, potentially with some extra force in there, commonly involved in sporting injuries, you're going to get that grinding sensation and that can lead to the injury itself. We also find that a flexed knee tends to actually create more of a vulnerability for the meniscus. And I think we can see that on the model here. If I was to flex the knee here, you can see how it puts more pressure on the back of the menisci, meaning that when you are flexed at the knee and there's a twisting injury as well, you can see just how much this thing moves around. So listen out for that when you're listening to your patient's story if they have indeed had a trauma. So what will our patients report subjectively. Well, they're going to have a relatively clear area of pain and that's normally around where the actual meniscal tear is. So therefore, when your patient is describing their tear, if the tear of their meniscus is actually here, they'll probably be able to pinpoint talk to you and say, it's right there, it's right on that point, that's where my pain is. And actually, this can be replicated on the objective exam because when you palpate around the joint line, they might say it's not painful there, not so much there, not so much there, but ow, right there, that's where I have my pain. So always look out for that, that pinpoint pain, both subjectively and on the objective assessment. Now, some of the other key things to consider is locking. Now, locking is where our patient finds that they're unable to fully extend or straighten their knee. And the clear thing here is that when you then assess them objectively, you'll find that you might try and move their knee physically and as they said, you can't fully extend it. So that's what we refer to as locking. And commonly, this is a pretty clear sign of a meniscal injury if it is a true sign of locking. That's why we really need to go to town asking our patient about locking because they might just think, oh yeah, my knee locks up, it gets really painful, I struggle to move it. And that's very different from our clear definition of being unable to straighten their knee, whether it's done themselves or by us as an examiner. 
So hopefully that gives you a good idea of how to look out for locking. So otherwise your patient might naturally find it difficult to move their knee into full flexion or extension because it's quite painful and there's likely to be an effect on their function. Number one, they probably won't be able to go back to sport because of the pain levels if they truly do have a meniscal injury, but also they might find it just difficult weight bearing. So look out for those things. So how about objective testing? How are we going to diagnose these injuries? Well, in the past, we may have used things like the McMurray's test or the Thessaly's test. However, what we've commonly found with these tests in practice is that they're really sensitive no matter what injury your patient has at their knee. If they have an ACL injury, it's going to be painful doing those tests. If they have a medial collateral ligament injury, it's going to be painful doing those tests. Osteoarthritis, patellofemoral pain, again, these tests can still be quite difficult for the patient to do and therefore they can't be as reliable as we once hoped. So what do I use personally? Number one, all of the subjective signs we talked about listening for that history of mechanism of injury, a clear trauma, was it a particular twisting injury in fact? Are we listening out for that true locking where they're unable to extend their knee, that pinpoint pain that they describe, but then also as a clinician, one of the other key objective tests I look for is pinpoint pain on palpation. Once again, as we said, working our way along that joint line, ow, right there where you're pressing, that's where I get my pain. Okay, so on to treatment. What do we find ourselves doing in physio? Well, a lot of the time you might find that these patients will trial physiotherapy as a first out to see if they can make significant progress in this manner in order to avoid surgery. Sometimes the one caveat to that, the one difference there is if your patient truly does have locking, whereby they're unable to extend their knee. In that situation, surgeons can sometimes do a small trial of physio to see if they can get the knee moving quickly, but don't be surprised if, if there isn't full extension by six weeks, the surgeon saying, no, that's not good enough, I'm not happy with that, I think I need to go in and operate on this knee to make sure that I can clear up this meniscal injury so that my patient can straighten their knee. Because there's a lot of side effects of not being able to extend their knee. You get stiffness of the joint, you get stiffness of the other structures, and commonly surgeons will find that if that extension is lost for a long period of time, it's difficult to get it back if it's been too long. So some simple principles in the early stages. Number one, reassure your patient try and help them get their pain under control with the help of doctors and the medical team with some painkillers on board. Using gradual progressive weight bearing, trying to help your patient get back on their feet and that might mean using something like crutches to help them do so. Now what about exercises? So very simple ones in the early stages, trying to get simple flexion and extension. Now, when we're talking about that locking where your patient can't fully extend, an exercise that I really find useful is trying to get your patient to squeeze their knee down into a little bit of a rolled up towel. Having something actually underneath their knee that they can slowly push into is a lot more comfortable than trying to push into thin air. And naturally, as they get better at extending, hopefully you can unroll that towel a little bit more so that they can then get their knee flat to the floor in time. Other simple exercises, Good old straight leg raises, really important for getting those quadriceps muscles working. And also I like to try and incorporate some weight bearing activity in the early stages. So we could look at some sit to stands. Now you can start with a staggered sit to stand with the injured leg in front to start with. That means that the patient's using a little bit more of their back leg, which will be their uninjured leg. But then as time goes on, as things get a little bit less painful, they can move their two feet in line to do a sit to stand where both legs are doing the work. How often? I tend to give these exercises out with a lower frequency in the early stages to allow for pain levels. So we might be looking at something like six to eight repetitions, two to three times a day. Okay, so you might have gone through physiotherapy with your patient. You might find that they're still experiencing lots of pain. They're still not moving their knee very well and they're still not back to their work or their sports. This is where we might have another conversation with the surgeons to see whether or not 
it's worth them reviewing the patient. They might do an MRI scan to see if there's a particularly focal meniscal tear and the extent of any injuries. And therefore, it's allowing them to then look at what surgery they might opt for. Are they going to do something like a meniscectomy, which is a pretty simple surgery where they just trim off a little bit of that meniscus, which is what they might do if there's a very small non-threatening tear. However, we do know that the more meniscus we remove, the more complications or the more vulnerable that knee is further down the line. Remember, we want this patient to have as much meniscus as possible for when they're 60, 70, 80 years old. So also, there's the possibility that your patient has a meniscal repair if we want to try and preserve as much of that meniscus as possible. Now, we've done some fantastic work with a brilliant orthopedic knee surgeon, Mr. Tricker, and he's done some great videos with us talking through why you might do which surgery. If you want details of that, click up here and have a watch. But otherwise, that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. Smash that like button. It's the number one thing you can do to help our channel. And check us out on Instagram at Clinical Physio and our website, clinicalphysio.com. Thanks so much again. I'm Khalid. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.